some way benefits the other. That's different than a parasitical relationship. You know, a parasite is something that enters your body and doesn't benefit you at all. It harms you. All right, you need to get rid of it. A symbiotic relationship is when an organism lives in harmony, in peace and harmony in your body. Okay? And you both get some kind of benefit from your mutual relationship. So in this case, there is a symbiotic relationship between a type of bacteria called Dodalines bacilli all right, and the human body, the female human body. The Dodalines bacilli colonize the vagina, just like E. coli colonizes the intestinal tract, and it feeds on the glycogen in the mucus. All right, as it feeds on the glycogen in the mucus, it metabolizes the glycogen and releases a waste product, and that waste product is lactic acid, which then acidifies the vagina. So you can see the symbiotic relationship here. The Dodalines bacilli get a source of nourishment or nutrients, all right, and the female gets, all right, the acidification of the vagina, which is a defense. Now, of course, the glycogen is produced by the mucus. The mucus depends upon the estrogen. So you could see, all right, down the line there might be a problem. All right, when menopause kicks in, for example, all right, estrogen levels drop dramatically. We're going to go over the menstrual cycle this evening, all right? But basically, after menopause, the estrogen cycles drop dramatically. So, all right, after menopause, a woman produces less mucus, all right, in the vagina. Therefore, there's less all right, food for the Dodalines bacilli to, to feed upon, there's less acidity, all right, and this increases the risk of infection. There's actually a type of vaginitis, itis is an inflammation of the vagina, which is typical of women past menopause, which is called atrophic vaginitis, which comes about as a result of a dry, decreased mucus, and decreased or increased alkaline vagina. All right, so that plays an important role. Now, the, the vagina itself is about seven and a half to 10 centimeters in length. It's essentially devoid of nerve sensation, uh, any kind of nerve sensation fibers. The second, actually, the cervix and the uterus are considered to be one organ. All right, but I, I listed them separately because the cervix is almost a unique organ unto its own but it's really part of the uterus. All right. If we look at this diagram, all right, I had it backwards, nobody noticed. <laughs> right. If we look at this diagram, Right. This would be the rectum. So this would be the large intestine, the sigmoid colon. All right, and this would be the anus. This would be the vaginal opening. So this whole structure here is the vagina. This opening here would be the urethra. All right, so we have urethra, vagina, anus. All right, so this is the bladder right here. Right? So rectum, bladder, and in between me, is the vagina. And then notice the vagina goes up to this large muscular organ. All right? This whole thing here, this whole structure is referred to as the uterus. All right? Notice there's a little opening in the center. There's a uterine cavity. All right? But this is all uterine material. Now, the uterus is often said to be divided into three parts. This part right here, which faces the vagina, all right, is called the cervix. So it's a very narrow opening into the uterine cavity right here, all right? So this is this muscular part, the, the very tip of the uterus here, which abuts, all right, or touches the vagina, all right, makes a transition from the vagina to the uterus, is called the cervix, and there's an opening in between it which goes into the uterine cavity. Then we have the large muscular the uterus is basically largely muscle. This is all muscle, 
And then the, the top of the uterus, right up here, is called the fundus. So basically, the uterus is divided into the fundus, which is the top part of it, all right, the body of the uterus, all right, and the cervix. Now the body of the uterus, this large muscular shaped thing, all right, consists of three layers. I'll just lift this up for a moment. All right. Those three layers are the outermost protective lining, which is called the parametrium. All right, peri surrounds it. The innermost layer, that was that huge muscular part, which is all muscle. All right, that's the myometrium. Myo is muscle. And the inner lining of the uterus, which is, all right, made up of about two layers of cells, all right, which is referred to as the endometrium. All right. Now the myometrium, all right, is largely muscular and, all right, if we go back to this for a minute, jump ahead to birth, all right, pregnancy, all right, the uterus, the fetus is going to develop, all right, implanted in the wall of the uterus. Somewhere, all right, lining the wall of the, on the wall of the uterus, all right, the developing fetus will implant, and that's where it grows, all right? So the developing fetus grows inside the uterus, all right? That's why the endometrium, which is the innermost lining, is going to play a very important role in the implantation of that fertilized egg. Right, because this is all myometrium muscle, when it's time for pregnancy all right, to terminate, for labor to occur, all right, being a tremendous muscular organ with all that myometrial muscle, they can contract all right, and help propel the infant out, all right, down past the cervix, down the vagina, all right, and out into the world. Now the endometrium, the innermost layer, as I said, is made up of two layers. All right, two cellular layers: the basal layer, all right, and the superficial layer. So this would be the lining of the uterine cavity. All right, what faces that is the endometrium. It's the endometrium. All right, that's going to receive a fertilized egg, should there be a fertilized egg, and will allow it to implant into the wall of the uterus. The superficial layer is continuously shed and regenerated between menarche and menopause. Remember, those are the two landmarks in the female physiology. Menarche is the time, is what we use, the term we use to refer to the onset of menstruation. All right, and menopause refers to the end point where menstruation stops. So between menarche and menopause, all right, we have every month the menstrual cycle, unless it's interrupted by pregnancy. All right, and each month that menstrual cycle basically is geared towards, all right, building up the endometrial lining so that it will be ready to receive a fertilized egg should a fertilized egg present itself. But then if a fertilized egg does not present itself, which is more than likely, you know, given 12 months a year, between the onset of monarchy is what, 10, 8, it's getting less and less nowadays, all right, and 45 to 50, all right, a woman has four or five pregnancies, that's only four or five. So most of the time the egg, the fertilized egg, the egg is not fertilized. You're with me, right? So then the egg simply gets washed out. We'll talk a little bit more about this. In that case, which is the point I was trying to make is what happens most of the time, the endometrial lining which has been built up just in case there was a fertilized egg is now sloughed off, all right? And that sloughing off is what produces, all right, the bleeding, so to speak. And then the whole process begins again where it has to be built up, all right? So that basal layer is like a germ layer all right, that constantly gives rise to the superficial layer. The superficial layer is built up during the first two weeks of the menstrual cycle in the event that a fertilized egg should present itself. And then if a fertilized egg does not present itself, 
at the two week point or thereabouts, all right, then, all right, the endometrial lining is sloughed off, which takes another two weeks, all right, and then the whole process begins over again. So the point I'm making is the endometrium is, the dy is a dynamic tissue, all right, which is largely under the influence of estrogen and progesterone, all right, and we'll talk more about that when we get to the menstrual cycle. Over here, this egg-like structure, all right, use my shadow here, this, of my finger, this egg-like structure is the ovary. And of course, this diagram just shows one ovary, but we know that there are two ovaries. All right, just the ovary is the female gonad, just like there are two testes. So if this is the egg-like structure, which is the ovary, you'll notice that there's this finger-like projection, like a glove, all right, is touching the ovary, all right, and then it comes down into a tube, all right, it turns out that, all right, the tube-like structure is the fallopian tube, which connects right to the uterus, Another word for the fallopian tube is the oviduct. So those are synonyms you can use either term, fallopian tube or oviduct. And notice the fallopian tube kind of flares out. That's those finger-like projections that seem to be touching the ovary. They tend to flare out, all right? That part that flares out here is called the fimbria. Now the ovary, all right, the female gonad, is where all of the eggs are stored from before birth. Remember we said experts estimate there's probably about a million eggs, all in suspended animation. And where each month between menarche and menopause, a few of these eggs are selected to complete their maturation. So we'll talk about that. All right, and eventually one of the eggs fully matures and is released around the 14th day of the menstrual cycle. All right, when it's released from the ovary, it falls. So that's why the fallopian tube is spread out like that, so it can catch the egg as it falls out of the ovary. All right, it's like, you know, a cornucopia, a horn of plenty. You know, it's like spreads out and the egg falls. It's going to fall right in there. It's not going to miss, you know. It's like a catcher's mitt. All right, and then the egg will work its way down the fallopian tube. All right, and the only place it can be fertilized is in the fallopian tube or the oviduct. Fertilization, if it is to occur, has to occur in that physical location. If there are no sperm, all right, in the fallopian tube or the oviduct at the time that the egg is released, then the egg will not be fertilized and it will pass down into the uterine cavity, will not implant onto the uterine wall, all right, and will be eventually washed out of the body. On the other hand, if the egg is present in the fallopian tube, which occurs on or around the 14th day of the cycle, you know, give or take a few days each way, all right, and sperm are present and the egg is fertilized, then the fertilized egg, and by the way, as soon as the egg is fertilized, it becomes the physiology changes in which it sends a signal, all right, which allows it to be implanted in the endometrium. If it's not fertilized, it can't be implanted. If it is fertilized, it can be implanted because it immediately undergoes changes that allow it to attach itself. All right, it will then travel down the oviduct, and when it gets into the uterine cavity, it will attach itself to the wall of the uterus, all right, by attaching directly to the endometrium, which has been prepared to receive a fertilized egg. All right, and then of course things change. All right, they don't go back to their normal cycle. The things, you know, the egg is maintained then for the nine months as it grows into a fetus. If it gets fertilized in the fallopian tube, how does it know not to attach to the fallopian tube? Is there like a signal that's? Well, that's what happens. See, that's why we have. Remember, I always say my famous saying is, if things if things never went wrong, there'd be no pathophysiology. All right, so that's when things go wrong. You have what's called an ectopic pregnancy. That's when it attaches to the fallopian tube. Sometimes even, 
all right? And that's dangerous. That will result in death or severe mor morbidity because if the fetus starts growing, all right, in the fallopian tube, it's eventually going to burst the fallopian tube, all right? And nobody will be able to ignore that. That's what, that would kill a lot of women. If they're lucky, they may survive, you know, with, with a quick response. All right, but that's very dangerous. Sometimes the fallopian tube is broken, and a fertilized egg may actually fall out of the fallopian tube and implant in the abdomen. All right, so that's a, a rare type of ectopic pregnancy, but it is possible. All right, I mean, there are cases of it on, on record. Which reminds me, I, here's a Dr. Z, believe it or not. <laughs> but I wouldn't tell you if it wasn't true. All right, I have a New York Times article to back it up somewhere in my files. <laughs> I don't know if you ever saw the movie, I said I go back to the movies, Junior, with Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, the short guy with Danny DeVito, where Danny DeVito plays uh, like a gyne obstetrician gynecologist and Arnold Schwarzenegger becomes pregnant. Do you remember that movie? I think it was called, I think that was the one that was called Junior. And uh, so the whole premise is, here's this big healthy guy, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Danny DeVito has figured out a way of, all right, he's experimenting, of implanting an egg, all right, into Arnold Schwarzenegger and having him become pregnant and deliver the baby, all right? And of course, he implants the egg into the abdomen, and the abdomen grows, and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger is pregnant and delivers the baby, and everybody says, oh, that's so ridiculous, you know, but it's a funny premise for a movie, especially with Arnold Schwarzenegger being pregnant, you know. Remember who Arnold Schwarzenegger Anyway, there was an article in the New York Times that said, based upon testimony from experts, that what was said in that movie could actually happen. Nobody's ever done it yet that they know of, but they said it's theoretically possible. Because of the fact that women can, there have been ectopic pregnancies, all right, where an egg is implanted in the abdomen, and then if the, the baby was actually, all right, went full term and then was removed from the abdomen by means of a surgical procedure, you know, that would be actually be a better chance than if it implanted in the fallopian tube because it would burst the fallopian tube, but it wouldn't burst the abdomen. All right? So the expert said if you took a fertilized egg from, you know, which could be done with reproductive technology, you could fertilize an egg in, in, uh, in vitro, in the, in the dish and then planted it in the male's abdomen and then pumped them with tons and tons of estrogen, which maintains the pregnancy, and progesterone. You could actually, that egg would actually grow in the male abdomen and would give rise, and then you would deliver it by means of an abdominal surgical procedure, it could be done. And there was actually this one guy that was looking for to do this, all right, but then he backed out the last minute because of, of you know, all the possibilities of what might happen. But, you know, I, I thought that was, I, I know you don't believe me, but I thought, you know, had they're always pitching ideas for reality shows, wouldn't this be a great reality show? I mean, if, feel free to pitch the idea to any of the, of the major networks if you want. I'm sure, you know, Fox News would pick it up right away. Fox, you know, you get 11 guys, there always seems to be 11 people in these reality things, you know, 11 or 12. You know, you get 11 men who are willing to have an A implanted in their abdomen. And you see which one gets to bring it to fruition. And they get a million dollars. And they get to be the proud father. <laughs> All right. So, if we look at the uterus, the fallopian tubes, I'm going to erase this. The uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries collectively are referred to as the adnexa. So that's another medical term that's worth filing away in your DNA. Adnexa. Just like vulva is a collective term for all the external genitalia, adnexa doesn't include the vagina, all right, but it includes the uterus, the 
floating through the ovaries. Okay, so this brings us now to a discussion of the menstrual cycle. And I think, I'm sure you've had this in biology, but I just want to review it with you, all right? Because what's really important, all right, is the idea of negative feedback. I'm sure you remember examples of this. biology, it occurs in many different hormonal systems. And we'll, when we talk about the thyroid gland and the adrenal gland, all right, we'll talk more. I mean, that uses the, the, uh, the mechanism of negative feedback as well. All right, but estrogen is a, is a hormone. And the idea of negative feedback, which is what makes the menstrual cycle possible, is the fact that, all right, I'm going to rewrite this on the board because it's important. The diagram I had last week. Up here we have the hypothalamus. Then we have the pituitary. And the hypothalamus, remember, releases GNRH, which causes the pituitary to release FSH and LH. And the female, we made the point that in the female cycle, these are released at different points. In the male, they're released together. But in the female, they're released at different points. The FSH then goes to the, all right, ovary and acts on what's called the follicle, which we'll define in a little bit in greater detail, which then causes the release of estrogen. All right. So we have a chain of events here. The hypothalamus initiates the chain of events by releasing gonadotropic releasing hormone, which stimulates the anterior pituitary to release FSH, which causes the FSH gets into the blood, goes to the ovary, stimulates the follicle within the ovary, and causes the follicle to grow and to begin to release estrogen, which goes into the bloodstream. So now estrogen starts building up in the bloodstream. All right. When estrogen builds up to a certain point in the bloodstream, the hypothalamus, which after all is located at the beginning of the cycle and initiates the whole thing, has these receptors that can sense the level of hormones, in particular, in this case, estrogen. And when the level of estrogen in the blood reaches a certain point, it stops, shuts off the production of GnRH, which then shuts off the production of FSH, which then shuts off the production of estrogen. Do you see what I'm talking about? So then the estrogen level starts to fall in the bloodstream. When the estrogen level is low again, the hypothalamus is always sensing and measuring the levels of hormone in the bloodstream. So when the level of estrogen is low in the bloodstream, it says, whoa, we need to get more estrogen going again. So it releases GnRH and starts the whole process over again, which then stimulates the pituitary to release FSH, which then stimulates the follicle to release estrogen. So the estrogen levels begin to build up again. All right? But as soon as they build up to a certain point, the whole system gets shut off again. So if we were to look at the level of estrogen in the bloodstream, say this is concentration. This is increase in concentration, all right? When the estrogen level falls below this point, all right, then the GnRH kicks in, FSH kicks in, estrogen starts being produced, the estrogen level starts building up in the bloodstream. When it reaches a certain preset point, all right, which is determined by the hypothalamus, so it's a higher concentration, all right? The hypothalamus then shuts the GnRH off, which shuts off the FSH, which then shuts off the estrogen. So now no estrogen is produced, it's used up, and the level of estrogen begins to fall. All right, when it gets back down to this level, the whole process goes back up again, and then down again. This is therapy for me, up again, down again. People often compare negative feedback, all right, uh, when they're thinking of an analogy to a thermostat. You know, you set your thermostat for, let's say, uh, 70 degrees, all right? When it gets cooler than 70, if it's a heat, I don't know, you want heat or air conditioning? Air conditioning. You set your air conditioning for 72 degrees, being a little more conservative here, all right? So when the air gets up to 70, when it cools up to 72, 
all right? The air conditioning unit shuts off. When it falls below 72, the air conditioning unit kicks back in again. So it keeps the temperature at 72 degrees, all right? That's what we mean by negative feedback. And it's not just estrogen, but many of the hormones, all right? In other systems as well, because after we finish talking about the reproductive system and, and we're gonna talk about the thyroid gland, for example, we'll see the thyroid hormones operate on a negative feedback mechanism similar to this. We're gonna talk about the adrenal gland, we'll see they operate on a negative feedback system like this. When we get to talk about diabetes, we'll see glucose, all right, has a certain negative feedback mechanism to it as well. All right, so this is an important concept. Okay, having said that as background, all right, we can now talk about the menstrual cycle. So we have to begin somewhere, and over here I have a diagram on the board. All right. Which shows level of hormone, and this is time. So, all right. Time going across this axis here would be in days, with the midpoint being 14 days. So we have a, a time stretched out from 128 days, which is an average length of a normal menstrual cycle. Again, you know, there's always individual variation. And the two hormones that we're talking about are estrogen and progesterone. Okay, so we begin somewhere, all right? Now, remember, we go back to the idea that there are a million eggs all right, in suspended animation in the ovary. All right, at the beginning of the cycle, all right, a few of these eggs are chosen, maybe six to 12 of them, all right? And the eggs that are chosen are called primary follicles. Now, follicle, is a larger structure that contains the egg within it. So when we talk about a follicle, we're talking about a structure that would have the egg, which is a single cell. But remember, it's the largest cell in the human body. And surrounding that egg would be all of these layers of tissue. All right? So the whole structure, the egg, plus all the tissue that surrounds it, is referred to as the follicle. All right. So of the million eggs that you have stored in the ovary, they're all in suspended animation. They are all primary follicles. Six to 12 of these are chosen. All right. Now, the hypothalamus, this is like at day one or day zero of the menstrual cycle. All right, that would also correspond to over here when the estrogen level is at its lowest. All right, at the very beginning of the cycle, the estrogen level is at its lowest. So negative feedback says to the hypothalamus, estrogen is really low. All right, so let's kick in and produce, all right, FSH. All right, so the FSH is going to go now to the ovary by means of the bloodstream, although, you know, it's being released by the pituitary, which is in the brain, gets into the blood, travels all the way down to the ovary, and it binds to those primary follicles, all six to 12 of them, or however many there are, but never more than 12 usually, all right? And the estrogen causes, uh, the FSH, that's why it's called follicle stimulating hormone, stimulates these follicles, because remember this is being released first, okay? It stimulates these follicles to grow, all right? And as they grow, they start releasing estrogen. So as time goes on, all right, more and as the follicles keep growing, just six, the six to 12 of them that were chosen, all right, more and more estrogen is being released from these six to 12 follicles into the bloodstream and the estrogen level starts to build up. Now, one of the things that estrogen does, all right, if we stay, take a few steps back for a minute, remember I made the point a little bit earlier that estrogen probably has a bit, about 100 different physiological processes that it uh, controls. But in this case, one of the things that estrogen does, all right, is it builds up the endometrial lining. Remember we talked about the endometrium? It has to get ready to receive an A in case it's, it presents itself. So 
In this case, as the estrogen level is building up, it's doing a lot of other stuff as well in the body, but it's also preparing the endometrial lining, all right, getting it ready to receive a fertilized egg should it present itself. Remember, some of the other things it does, it increases mucus secretion, but it also builds up the endometrial lining. All right, well, we have to come back and talk a little bit more about all the wonderful things estrogen does, but I don't want to lose my thread right now, okay? So these six to 12 primary follicles are developing, getting larger and larger, producing more and more estrogen. Estrogen level is building up, all right? The lining of the endometrium is starting to build up, getting ready. All right, and then it reaches a point right here. All right, somewhere just between the four, before the 14th day, about the middle of the cycle, maybe the 12th day. All right, something like that. All right, where according to the hypothalamus, it reaches its maximum level. All right, so the hypothalamus now shuts off the production of FSH, and this actually now. All right, causes the estrogen level to start to fall. Because now, once FSH is shut off, the follicles can no longer produce estrogen. All right, I mean, they, they're not stimulated to produce more estrogen. They're just gonna start releasing what's left. All right, so the level of estrogen starts to fall. It's this sudden decrease in estrogen, right here, this spike. It, it's a spike and then it decreases. All right, it's that signal the sudden switching from FSH, all right, shutting off estrogen, that's the signal that causes one of the eggs to be released from the ovary and to fall into the fallopian tube. The process whereby a mature egg ready to be fertilized is released from the ovary into the fallopian tube is called ovulation. Now, it was determined before this point that only one of these 6 to 12 primary follicles, all right, and by the way, as they're growing and releasing estrogen, they're called secondary follicles now, all right, only one of them, all right, is going to develop completely, all right, for the egg to mature 100%. The others, all right, lose the beauty contest, are not chosen, all right, and merely play a supporting role by secreting estrogen. One of these six to 12 was chosen, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the criteria is, you know, like, like at the beauty pageants, you know, like, what do you think about world hunger? And maybe the primary follicle that had the best answer gets to be the secondary follicle that develops, I don't know. But only one of them is, all right, and the one that's chosen, all right, gets, it's like it's, you know, super special attention and becomes known as the graphene follicle. That's the one. All the others are in a supporting position. The other secondary follicles are in supporting positions and will continue to produce estrogen during that period of time, during the first 14 days, first 12 days, whatever it is. But the graphene follicle is the one that's being groomed for the egg to actually be released. And when there's that sudden decrease in estrogen, all right, that's the signal for the graphene follicle to release its egg, all right, into the oviduct. So just one cell is released into the oviduct, and that's the egg. The remaining fragments of the cells that make up the follicle remain behind. All right, and just the egg is released. But the egg now has its own special structure surrounding it. And one of the things that surrounds the egg is a special membrane. The egg that's being released is a special membrane called the zona pellucida. Remember we said last week, last Tuesday, on Tuesday, all right, that as soon as one sperm penetrates, the membrane hardens to prevent other sperm from entering. That's the zona pellucida. It's soft, and as soon as one sperm enters, the zona pellucida hardens and prevents all of the sperm from entering, which is important because you can't have more than, a, than one sperm entering delivering just an N or haploid number of DNA. All right, so to get back to our, our drama here, 
6 to 12 primary follicles have been selected. Under the influence of FSH, they start releasing, they become stimulated, and they start producing estrogen, which gets into the bloodstream and starts preparing the endometrial lining for possible implantation of a fertilized egg. One of those 6 to 12 primary follicles, they're now called secondary follicles once they start releasing estrogen, right? So they're all secondary follicles now once they've been chosen, all right? One of them is groomed to be the actual one that releases the egg. It's called the graphium follicle. When there's a sudden dip in estrogen, all right, that egg, that graphium follicle releases its egg into the ov into the ov duct or the fallopian tube. All right, what's left behind now are all right six to twelve secondary follicles, all right, which have eleven of them have not released an egg, all right, but they still left behind. Now what happened is when this decreased. When the hypothalamus said shut off FSH, at the same time it said shut off FSH, all right, it said turn on LH, luteinizing hormone. Now luteinizing hormone gets into the bloodstream, all right, and starts, see right here, the luteinizing hormone starts getting here now. Luteinizing is short for, it comes from the term corpus luteum because as soon as those secondary follicles, all right, no longer have a chance, you know, after the estrogen stops stimulating them, they now become reactive not to FSH but to LH. See what I'm saying? And the LH turns them from a secondary follicle, which was producing estrogen under the influence of FSH, to a structure called a corpus luteum. which produces progesterone. So, here the follicles were producing estrogen. Here the follicles have turned into corpus luteum and are producing, releasing progesterone. So now you see the progesterone level starts to go up. And notice the progesterone level reaches its peak right around here. All right. What does progesterone do? Progesterone helps to maintain, the estrogen has done its job now, and build up the endometrial lining, all right, so that it's ready to receive an implanted egg. The progesterone now maintains that endometrial lining, all right, and in the event that a fertilized egg, a fertilized egg doesn't plant, it helps to maintain it, all right, but, as we said, most of the time, the egg is not fertilized, and so does not implant. So when the progesterone reaches this point here, and there's no signal from the uterus that an egg is implanted, the hypothalamus, after all, the hypothalamus is part of brain tissue, so let's say it's pretty smart, all right? If there's no signal saying pregnancy has occurred, all right, fertilization has occurred, it simply uses negative feedback. It says progesterone has reached its high point, all right? and it shuts off the production of LH. All right, so now the corpus luteum stops producing progesterone, and you can see the progesterone level starts to fall. As the progesterone level starts to fall, and notice the estrogen level hasn't really kicked up yet, the endometrial lining can't be maintained and begins to slough off. All By this time, the estrogen is hit bottom, and the whole process begins over again. Another six to 12 primary follicles are selected. They're turned into secondary follicles. They release estrogen. The estrogen peaks. The lining is built up. Once it peaks, it stops, all right? That sudden decrease in estrogen is a signal for ovulation to occur. The egg is released. If the egg is not fertilized, all right? All right, it's going to be washed out. But meanwhile, that's also the signal for the hypothalamus to produce LH, which causes the follicles to turn into corpus luteum, which begin to produce progesterone, which helps to maintain the endometrial lining. All right, but if there's no implanted egg, the progesterone level peaks, gets shut off, okay? And 
All right, the endometrial lining is sloughed off. Now, what happens to those corpus luteums? They've had an interesting history. From, the, from before birth, they were primary follicles, a million of them just sitting in cold storage. Then, six to 12 were chosen. They became secondary follicles. All right, they released estrogen, then they turned into corpus luteum, and they re released progesterone. Now, they're finished releasing progesterone, so they turn into scar tissue. And this scar tissue, these are now, they're now called, or can be recognized in the ovary, all right, if you look at them under the microscope as scar tissue, they're called corpus albicans. Albicon means white. Now, if, remember, most of the time fertilization does not occur, and so this is what we see. But, of course, if fertilization has occurred, if that egg was fertilized in the oviduct, right, it's going to be fertilized right around here, all right, because ovulation occurs right here, it takes a few hours or a day or so, the egg it lingers in the fallopian tube, 14th day or around there, you know, it's a little give or take. Fertilization occurs, it takes a while for the egg to travel down, all right, into the uterus, when it finally gets to the uterus, it's perfectly ready, okay? Progesterone is doing its job in maintaining the, uh, the uterine lining. And then plants in the lining of the uterus, in the, in the endometrial lining, and it starts growing. Now, as soon as it implants itself, which is right around here, all right, in the uterine lining, all right, and it starts dividing and these membranes start forming, all right, one of the membranes that forms is called the chorion. This happens within hours, very quickly, all right? And this membrane, which surrounds, you know, the fertilized egg is no longer just one cell now, it's growing, all right? This first structure begins to release a hormone called HCG, which stands for human chorionic gonadotropin. HCG. Now, ask yourself, when is the only time HCG is present in a female's body? If a fertilized egg is implanted, because it has to come from the membrane that developed from a fertilized egg. So the only time the body ever sees HCG is in the instance of a fertilized egg implanting. As soon as that HCG is being released, it's a hormone into the bloodstream the hypothalamus picks that up as a signal, and that's how it determines that a implantation has occurred. So now it says, all bets are off. We're not gonna follow our usual routine of negative feedback because a fertilization has occurred, and if we follow negative feedback, the egg would be washed out. You know, we couldn't maintain the, uterine, the endometrial lining. So what it does is, all right, if there's HCG present here, the progesterone continues to go up like this to maintain the uterine lining and it kicks the estrogen in, so the estrogen level starts to go up as well. So both estrogen and progesterone are maintained at very high levels, all right, almost throughout the entire pregnancy from this point on. All right, and a lot of experts think it's the presence of HCG that produces perhaps symptoms like morning sickness. You know, because most women have never experienced HCG, no, you know, before. It's novel to them, okay? If it's produced right away, then how come like it takes a while for a pregnancy test to come back healthy? Well, it not produced. It takes you know, I don't know. <laughs> you got me. I mean, a pregnancy test is good within a week or I mean, how long before a pregnancy test comes back positive? But that's a, a I mean, it has to be a certain level of it that can be detected in the urine. All right, and that might take a, a, a few days to build up to that concentration. All right, I mean, the hypothalamus probably senses it way before. All right, could be satisfied and released in the urine. But this is an important point because this is the basis behind pregnancy tests. All right, you put the dipstick in the urine, and the dipstick is especially treated. If there's any traces of HCG in the urine, all right, which means that the body was producing and is getting rid of some of it, it turns the dipstick a certain color. All right, I mean, so if a woman is pregnant, she's going to have HCG. All right, and that's the positive pregnancy test. If she's not pregnant, there won't be any HCG. I have a different question. What would happen if 
two eggs when it came in instead of one? Yeah, that happens a lot of times. You know, we get twins. We get fraternal twins. Okay. All right, as opposed to identical twins. Okay. All right. So two eggs implant. All right. And they each get, if it's fraternal twins, they each get their own placenta. If it's identical twins, they share the same placenta. All right. I will actually talk more about that. All right. Um, I mean, that means in the case of fraternal twins that more than one egg was released. You know, things don't always work out, you know, with just one egg, you know. And, you know, I think fertility drugs cause more eggs to be released than normal, which is why a woman taking fertility drugs tends to have a higher incidence of multiple births. If, if two eggs were released, would it come out of the same graphene follicle or would it be two? Two graphene? separate ones. So it would be two graphene follicles. Right. Follicle. So that's what happens, you know. Remember. Identical twins is one egg, which, as soon as it's fertilized, starts dividing and breaks into two. So that's why they're genetically identical. All right, because it was only one egg and one sperm. All right? But fraternal twins could be a boy and a girl. All right, it's two eggs. All right, two sperm. So it's just like siblings as opposed to identical twins. All right? And that would mean that more than one graphene follicle developed and more than one egg was released. Has there ever been two, two identical? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a case where they could be fraternal twins and identical. Yeah, it's really. Yeah, I mean, those are really statistically they're very rare, but I'm sure they have been. I, I can't pinpoint it right now. Oh yeah, there was a case in in Duluth, Minnesota. All right, in 1937. <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of cases like that. You know, I mean, multiple births are usually fraternal, but sometimes um, there may be two twins and, 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 and separate from that, all right? Now, you can see also, all right, first of all, all right, simple birth control, all right, is the rhythm method. All right, the only time the egg can be fertilized is right around here. The egg doesn't hang out in the fallopian tube more than a few days. If nothing happens, it gets washed out. And it has to be fertilized in a fallopian tube. So, if there's no presence of sperm during a few days around midpoint, all right, then fertilization will not occur. Sperm here, sperm here, it's too late or too early, all right? So the egg is not present. So that's what constitutes what's referred to as the rhythm method of birth control. That's used both for birth control, all right, and it's also used for women who want to get pregnant. I mean, you've probably seen all those movies, you know, where the woman says they want to have a baby, and the woman calls us up, it's time, come home, quick. You ever see those movies? Yeah. Because just when this happens, there's a sudden increase in body temperature. There's a spike in body temperature. So, you know, they're always taking their temperature. Oh, yeah, you know, because this is the case. <laughs> you know, so it works both ways. Of course, it's not very reliable, all right? I mean, for birth control, I mean, it works, it, 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 you know. But there's always, you know, it could be a three to five day variation around here, you know, it could be, and you know. All right, the other means of, of birth control is that you could have, a, have a, a ligation of the oviducts, right? Just like that would be analogous to a vasectomy in a male, all right? You can have a ligation of the oviduct so the eggs can't pass. All right, so that would be a type of birth control. And then there are chemical means of birth controls. I mean, this drop in estrogen right here is extremely important for the release of the egg. If you keep estrogen level high, all right, then the egg will be released. See what I'm saying? Now, birth control is, there are several ways of doing birth control pills, all right? I mean, but basically, all right, some of them prevent implantation of the egg that's been released, others prevent the egg from being released. I'm, you know, and I'm not an expert in this, I really don't know, you know. But I mean, I think we all understand and you can see that if you manipulate these hormones, and birth control pills are usually always combinations of estrogen and progesterone, taken at different times, okay? You can override or fool the hypothalamus 
all right, and prevent fertilization from, from an egg either being released or from an egg being implanted, all right? And that's the way uh, birth control pills work. Okay, so now we move on to, are there any questions about the, the menstrual cycle? Okay, so now we move on to disorders. I put a whole series of uh, vocabulary words for menstrual disorders here. They're all deviations of a normal menstrual um, menstruation. So let's just go through these terms and just define the terms first. Amenorrhea is all right, the absence of menstruation. So all right. A woman stops menstruating or never menstruates. And that would be the difference between primary and secondary. So primary amenorrhea is menarche never occurs. Okay. So that happens, okay? There are certain genetic conditions that may cause that. For example, there's a condition called Turner's syndrome. Just, there are many of them, but there's this one condition, all right, which is a good illustration of this, which is called Turner's syndrome. In Turner's syndrome, all right, what happens is one X chromosome is missing, so we use a zero to represent the absence of an X chromosome. So all 20, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes, but the 23rd pair are the sex chromosomes, which are either XX or XY. All 22 pairs of normal chromosome, of autosomal chromosomes, body chromosomes are normal, but when it came to getting, all right, the sex chromosomes, something happened and there was only one X chromosome, all right, and so, all right, this is a viable person, but they're born, all right, they're usually severely mentally retarded and have other physical characteristics that identify them. But with an X chromosome missing, they will never, all right, uh, develop, uh, they'll never go through monarchy. They'll never develop uh, eggs, all right, never release them, never produce uh, adequate amounts of, you know, a larger amounts of estrogen or whatever. That would be primary aim. All right, secondary amenorrhea is much more common. This would be where menstruation has been occurring. All right, and then all of a sudden stops. Now, there could be a lot of reasons for this. I mean, probably a leading cause of it would be anorexia nervosa. All right. And this is also illustrative of the fact that for monarchy to actually occur, there has to be a certain amount of body fat present before monarchy will occur, all right? Which is why women, girls who are very thin, like gymnasts or ballerinas, may have delayed uh, monarchy, all right? Because they don't, it has to be a certain amount of body fat before, all right, you'll actually begin to menstruate. But then you can have a woman that's been menstruating and let's say all of a sudden she loses a lot of weight, anorexia nervosa, right? And she becomes, loses all her body fat one of the side effects that would be amenorrhea, all right? Because there has to be a certain amount of body fat, all right? There are certain, as in, in fat, there are certain uh, enzymes that convert uh, precursor substances like testosterone into estrogen. So without a lot of body fat, you really decrease your amount of estrogen. All right, and of course, there can be many other reasons, all right? So if you, amenorrhea should be taken seriously, and usually it's if it, menstruation stops for more than uh, two months in a row, all right? A woman may occasionally miss a period and it's not considered necessarily amenorrhea. It would have to be longer than that. So two months? Right. What are like, like In a row. I know, but what should you worry about though, after that? Like, if a woman misses it, like what are the side effects of like, missing it? Oh, okay, well the side effects would be you, you don't produce enough estrogen. Now, you know, 
that maybe is a good point to talk about what some of the other things that estrogen is important for. Estrogen is important for bones. All right. Um, estrogen helps keep bones from breaking down. All right. So if you lose a lot of estrogen, you become amenorrheic. Your bones become brittle. You develop osteoporosis. I saw a special on TV, which I thought was really, it was kind of poignant. You know? I mean, it was these ballerinas. You know, they starve themselves and become amenorrheic. Then they become osteoporotic. And the, and the guy drops her, and that's the end of her career. You know? I, I was asking because um, when I was in Marine Corps boot camp, 90% of the females lost their period. And it, it's funny that you say that, like with the bones and everything, because about 50% of the females there had hip fractures. Yeah, it, it's like, really, I'm glad you pointed that out. That's yeah. another, can I use that story in, in, in years because, to come like about marine recruits? That's a good one. I lost it for a whole year. Uh huh. And, you know, I had a stress fracture in my hip mm -hmm. from like all like the, you know, having packs and like doing uh -huh. the, the marches and everything like that. Right. And almost 90% of females, they it. Yeah, it's serious. All right. When you're that young, it probably doesn't have a significant effect on your cardiovascular system. But you know, it, estrogen also is what we call. Remember, in Prato one, I think I use the term cardioprotective. So it can also accelerate atherosclerosis, you know, and other problems like that. Um, and of course, you know, if it's caused by loss of body fat, that's one thing. But there may be cancers and other types of, of disorders of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland that may also be causing this. So there could be a lot of reasons. So if, you know, it, it's something that should be looked at, you know. I'm not sure if this is a myth or not. Maybe you can clear this up, but I was I've heard that when there's a lot of like in college, let's say when a lot of girls live together, and one girl gets her period, a lot of other girls get it at the same time. When yeah, there have been scientific studies that have shown that's true. Okay. Yeah, and it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, you know, if they live together in, in the same dorm and they're close with each other, they tend to, to begin to synchronize their cycles together. It's a very interesting phenomenon, you know? I mean, what is the implication of that? It, all right? It means that maybe, all right, we are more energy fields than we think we are, and that we are emanating certain signals in these energy fields that can attract other people. I mean, there have been a, a lot of studies, and I teach P&I, psychoneuroimmunology, and there are studies that indicate that if a person is very happy and in a good mood, it tends to be contagious to other people. How do you explain something like that? If, on the other hand, if a person is very sad and depressed, it could also be contagious to the people around them. You know, I mean, they can also do brainwave studies, which makes it more interesting. I mean, it, it's one thing to say, oh, <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, everybody likes to be around so and so because it makes them happy. You know, he's always or she's always so happy. But they actually do brainwave studies and see that they begin to light up the same areas of the brain together. You know, husband and wife sometimes if they go into a procedure together and the husband holds the wife's hand, you know, a certain part of the brain lights up which decreases the amount of pain compared to what other people experience and things like this. So maybe there's an energy field, all right, that's transmitting these things, which is really interesting because if we're all part of an energy field, why don't we call that energy field the, uh, the uh, non-local mind? And we all tap into a non-local mind. Now we're getting really spooky. <laughs> anyway. All right. Uh, a little menorrhea. These are just terms now. And basically these all present as symptoms, all right, which should all be looked into. All right. Uh, and as we go through the different disorders, we'll see how some of these show up as disorders. You know, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on them right now, but just to define them, is scanty or small amounts. Oligo always means small, few. All right. This woman has a very uh, scanty uh, bleeding. Menorrhagia would be the exact opposite. It's really excessive bleeding. It's not just the amount, but it's the duration of the bleeding. And sometimes. The bleeding may last up to nine days, all right? That would be menorrhagia, it's excessive bleeding. Metorrhagia is bleeding between periods. And menometorrhagia would be a combination of these two. So that would be 
excessive heavy bleeding with bleeding between periods. Now, any of these could be symptoms of, all right, uh, uh, a lot of different gynecological disorders, cancers, all right, blood dysgrasias, all right, they could represent a lot of different things and, and probably they will re require some type of workup, all right, to determine what the cause is. Now, dysmenorrhea, all right, is severe painful cramping just before or during menses. It's estimated that 50% of menstruating women have some degree of dysmenorrhea. One of the things that's been implicated, which I think I pointed out when we talked about the prostate gland, maybe I didn't in patho one, but I, I always think it's, I'm sure you, I, I said it, but the word prostaglandin, remember how I thought that, so I, I, I just think that's very unusual that, you know, a thing that causes so many problems in women is called a prostaglandin, and women don't even have a prostate gland. I mean, how'd that happen? But, you know, the pain and cramping of, of the, associated with dysmenorrhea is traced back to an excessive amount of prostaglandins. In particular, remember we said prostaglandins can have many different forms. There's one type of prostaglandin called prostaglandin F2. All right. Now, what's important is, you know, treatment for dysmenorrhea is basically geared towards relief of the symptoms. If there's a lot of edema associated with the cramping and, and uh, pain, then diuretics might be indicated. All right, for the pain analgesic agents like aspirin and Tylenol, all right, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, all right, or in really severe cases, oral contraceptive drugs can be given because they will prevent period from occurring. All right. Now, premenstrual syndrome, all right, which is simply abbreviated PMS, is like dysmenorrhea taken to the next level, all right? Um, technically, dysmenorrhea only occurs for the few days before, you know, immediate, the period immediately before and after a menstruation. Dysmenorrhea begins usually at least a week or 10 days before, all right, a mens the menstruation occurs. All right, and so it's much more of a syndrome. It lasts a longer period of time surrounding the menstru menstruation, all right, leading up to it. And the symptoms, some of which may also be present in dysmenorrhea, but remember with PMS, we're talking about something that lasts much longer and is much more severe. All right, it would be painful and swollen breasts, bloating, abdominal pain, headache, back aches, depression, anxiety, irritability, behavior changes. So if we go back to this diagram for a minute, all right, this is where ovulation occurs at day, at day 14 I've got it on. As the estrogen is being released during the first half of the cycle, that's called the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle because the follicles are developing. And then after ovulation, when the corpus luteum is releasing progesterone, that's called the luteal phase. So PMS begins as soon as the luteal phase starts, usually, okay? And a lot of it's been traced to progesterone, excessive levels of progesterone. There have been, it's interesting, but you know, the depression, the anxiety, the irritability, the behavior changes have been used as a defense all right, in court, which I thought was interesting. You know, I remember reading cases where, all right, Madam X killed her husband, but it's not her fault. She suffered from PMS, and he just pushed the wrong button. <laughs> Your Honor, please, we throw yourself on the mercy of the court. You couldn't help yourself. And then, uh, you know, so that's very interesting, you know, because of the behavioral changes and so forth that they play. I can see that. A lot, a lot of that might take place during that time. Whether it really works, I don't know. I, I don't know if that person got off or not. 
analogously, it reminds me of men saying, you ever hear of this thing called roid rage in men? I mean, it's like, you know, in roid rage, roid's short, short for androgens, you know, uh, short for steroids, you know? Men start taking testosterone to build up their muscles and so forth like that. And, you know, before you know it, what is te one of the things testosterone does is it causes aggression. You know, I mean, if you're a football player, you know, you, a little testosterone could get you out on that football field, all right, and make you a little bit more, you know, vicious, all right. So there have been cases in court where it's the same thing. Your Honor, Mr. X killed his his uh, wife because he was in roid rage. He couldn't help it. So Madam X, Mr. X, you know, it's kind of analogous. Too much of those hormones are a bad thing. Which just reminds me right now, I, want, I did clip this article because I wanted to inform you, all right, I think it's important to keep in mind, that women do produce testosterone. We've already established that. But there was this interesting article that gives some more information about the role of testosterone in women. All right? Now, the interesting thing is, all right, that in males, the testes produces testosterone but no estrogen. However, the adrenal glands do produce estrogen in the males. In the females, the adrenal glands produce both estrogen and testosterone, but the ovary also produces a certain amount of testosterone. All right, and you know, one of the things is, probably the reason for that is that there are enzymes in the body that can convert testosterone to estrogen. All right, so therefore, you know, the testes don't have to produce estrogen because, all right, all you have to do is take some enzymes and convert all the testosterone you want into estrogen. But, you know, you can't convert estrogen into testosterone. So therefore, maybe that's the reason why women also produce a certain amount of testosterone in their ovaries as well as in their adrenal glands. But by no means do they ever produce as much as men do. By the way, it's important that this enzyme exists. This enzyme is called, it's all coming back to me now. It's called aromatase because of the strange name of this enzyme. And studies have shown that estrogen works on the brain, all right, to improve learning. So, you know, men would be complete dummies if they didn't have the ability to convert some testosterone into estrogen. But that's another story. All right? So here it is with the estrogen. Men have, and the testosterone, men have between 300 and 900 nanograms of testosterone for every deciliter of blood. All right, much of it generated by the testes, but some originating in the adrenals. All right. In women, a high measurement of testosterone is 100 nanograms. So 300 to 900 for men, very high is 100, but usually women have about 40, as the article goes on to say. It's about the average norm, about 40 nanograms. All right. But the testosterone level varies significantly with the menstrual cycle, as do the more stereotypically female hormones, estrogen and progesterone. All right, so each ovary contributes a certain amount of testosterone, all right, and it varies according to the menstrual cycle, all right, meaning that a woman's maximum androgen secretion corresponds with her estrogen spike, all right, and hence with her uh, ovulation. All right, what does testosterone do in girls? It contributes to their adolescent development as well. It makes pubic and underarm hair grow, it could help their muscles and bones develop, all right, but it also interacts with estrogen, which is known to be necessary for calcium absorption and, and bone strength, which is basically unclear. All right, so now the question, the article goes on. The question is, to, what about women have too little testosterone? What about women have too much testosterone? All right, I mean, there's a norm there, but again, we have pathophysiology, and we have situations where women have too little testosterone, all right? And we have situations where they have too much testosterone. If they have too little testosterone, all right, it may affect their libido, all right? Um, and because it's linked to estrogen in the ovaries a lot, what, what they're discovering is a lot of times after menopause, a woman's testosterone levels falls dramatically. And so there are some doctors that recommend not only estrogen replacement therapy, but also some amount of testosterone along with it. But basically, too little testosterone in women is not as significant or severe as too much testosterone. All right, too much testosterone, all right, is going to be linked to excessive body hair, 
all right? It's what they call the adrenal genital syndrome sometimes. It could also be linked to something that's called the polycystic ovary, all right, syndrome, all right? Uh, which also causes problems with uh, insulin and diabetes, okay? Because it alters insulin secretion, all right? Too much testosterone. So anyway, that's just something that I wanted to point out, all right, for you to be aware of, all right? Um, we should say something about estrogen replacement therapy. I've read the latest studies on this. I just ordered a book, and I, just for that very reason, so I could be up to date on it. It was a, a Cliff Notes on 50 studies that doctors should know. I thought, hey, that's great, you know? In other words, it summarizes the major research studies because there's been a lot of controversy surrounding estrogen replacement therapy. You know what I'm talking about? It's often called HRT, hormone replacement therapy. A woman goes through menopause, okay? So the estrogen level drops dramatically. The question is, should she be given estrogen as a replacement to make up for the estrogen she lost, lost? Because of the amazing effects that we know estrogen has. It protects bones, it keeps them from breaking down. All right, it's cardioprotective, all right? So for a while there, women were given estrogen replacement and also helps get them through the, the, uh, the painful transition, all right? Because menopause often lasts a few years, all right, and can cause a lot of uncomfortable symptoms when a woman is going through it, all right? So the question is, all right, should estrogen be given to women as a replacement therapy when their levels begin to decline? What do you think? What do you think the results of the studies are? The most definitive ones now. Is it a good idea? I heard that um, they were trying to get the woman's own hormones, something that's closer to your own body's hormones than uh, like uh, alternative means, because it has less side effects. Right. Basically, what they found is, I, I think you're right, I mean, there are different formulations now, all right? And uh, what they basically studied is, is estrogen combined with progesterone, all right, combination. But originally they thought that, I mean, you could do no harm with giving estrogen as a replacement, all right? And initially it was used for women who were at risk for osteoporosis, because think about it, all right? When does osteoporosis really kick in for a lot of women after menopause? Because they lose all that estrogen. All right, but then it was also thought it would be cardioprotective. So they, doctors started giving estrogen replacement therapy routinely and women started demanding it, all right? So after several years passed, because, all right, studies were done, and it was shown that it has no effect on, on preventing stroke, preventing heart attacks, all right? And it increases the risk of breast cancer and other types of uh, uterine and cervical cancer, all right? So therefore, all right, the conclusion is that a woman should be given perhaps a certain formulation of estrogen in a reduced amount to get her through the symptoms of menopause, but should not be put on long-term estrogen therapy unless she has really severe risk of osteoporosis, in which case the risk of cancer, all right, outweighs the, uh, uh, is outweighed by the good it would do in preventing osteoporosis. So the bottom line, if I could summarize this one more time, then I'll give you a chance to run over to the cafeteria if you want, is that Estrogen is useful to give in small doses to a woman going through menopause. It helps you get through the symptoms of menopause. But unless a woman has severe osteoporosis, or the risk of severe osteoporosis, in which case it will be indicated to give, continue giving estrogen replacement therapy, all right, there are really other, no other benefits to estrogen, such as cardioprotective or preventing stroke, and it may actually increase the risk of getting certain types of cancer, so it's not uh, recommended. I know that was bothering you when you were really you know, anxious know what the answer to that was. But as is true in everything, I suggest you keep tuned. Because, you know, the first study said, yeah, 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 go, go, go. And now the studies say, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. So, you know, the next group of studies five years from now will probably be, we were wrong. So you just have to pay attention. Okay. Why don't we take a 15 minute break. We'll come back. I have 6.20, so we'll come back at 25 to 7. Professor, is it true that 
which is why fibroids usually shrink after menopause. Oh.